I'm Kelly Siegler, and I was a prosecutor for over 21 years. I'd been involved in more than 200 trials, around 60 murder cases, and 20 death penalty cases. Hello, Rhonda. Hey, Kelly, how are you? Good, how are you? The prosecutor is the voice for the victim and for their loved ones in that courtroom. My job is to seek justice. And when you meet the victim's family, it's really easy to know who you're getting justice for. What did that feel like, watching him take his last breath, dying before your eyes? We were taught at our office that your courtroom is your living room. And anytime we can reenact and show exactly what we think happened to the victim, we do that. She turned that bedroom into a torture chamber, that bed into a butcher block. In 2004, I tried the case of the murder of Jeffrey Wright. During the trial, I brought the brutalness of the crime into the courtroom. Were all of these injuries in the chest area consistent with the knife being held in this direction? To get my point across, I used a tactic that was at the time controversial. It garnered a lot of press and even more criticism. This case changed the course of my career in ways I've never talked about. When my daughter started working as a prosecutor, defense lawyers told her her first day at work, you know, your mom was wrong what she did in that courtroom. I don't care. I'm glad I did it. I know why I did it. I'm proud I did it. And it was the right thing to do. So here's the bed pieces. Where's the mattress? They burned it because it was... It was bad. It was, yeah, that biohazard. Where's everything else? Right around the corner. Oh, come show me. Today, I'm at the Harris County Evidence Archives, which is only open to lawyers. The shovel. I, I didn't remember if we recovered the shovel or not. I haven't seen this stuff in over 20 years, and looking through all this makes me feel like I'm right back in that courtroom all over again. So this knife is different than a typical knife in a murder case because piece is missing, State's Exhibit 65, and that's the piece that's found embedded in Jeffrey's skull. I wanted the jury to have a true picture of the injuries. Look how few are on his back. So that's how you know he was tied down the whole time. This tells the whole story of the torture. The night that this case began started like any other night, but it quickly changed into a case that none of us involved would ever forget. On a Saturday evening, a defense attorney came into the district attorney's office during non-public hours and said they could find a dead body in the backyard of the house at this address. It's really unusual for a defense lawyer to report a crime. He doesn't identify who the person is, but we all figured out pretty quickly that the reason Neil Davis was the reportee was probably because he was representing somebody that had something to do with why that body was in the backyard. The people that lived at 10822 Berry Tree Drive were Jeff and Susan Wright and their two children. This is a middle-class neighborhood. It's midnight. We're using flashlights to try to light that area up and see. When they looked inside the patio portion, they saw the head and shoulder of what they believed to be a male subject. You see an arm, part of a hand, and you see it could be a head. The rest of it's buried. In Texas, the body actually belongs to the medical examiner, and we don't touch it until they get there. I'm looking at this body. There was a ligature, a cloth tied around both of the wrists, and then there was one around one of the ankles, and I could see there was a massive amount of stab wounds to the front side of his body. I was surprised that 
how much violence had, had gone on there. As we were looking at the scene and taking everything in, we noticed a hunting knife. It was near the body in a flower pot. There was a good chance that that was involved in our murder. There were no witnesses at the scene, just constables, officers, and a defense attorney. I spoke with him briefly. He can't tell me much because attorney-client privilege. I can not remember that ever happening on another scene. I got a call from Sheriff's Department Homicide, who I worked with a lot, saying, Kelly, we need you to come out to a scene because we have a defense lawyer out here, and we need you to run interference while we process the scene and figure out what the heck is going on. Going to a scene in person is something that you never forget. I've never been asked to do that before. I've never been asked to do that since. I mean, I'm used to seeing really, really bad pictures, but I'm not used to seeing it up front and personal, no. When you're a girl prosecutor, mostly working with guys, I remember always thinking, be cool, be strong, be in control, and act like you know what you're doing, even when you don't. There were all these things in the backyard that should have been inside the house. A mattress that was bloody, the sideboards, the headboard, the footboard. It was just chaos. When they shine the flashlight on the mattresses, we can see dark stains. You think it's blood, but you really can't tell at night. It was saturated. It hit me right then and there. Somebody needs to show a jury how this bed was used in the commission of this murder. And I asked the crime scene guy to take the bed and store it in the property room. When you get past the patio, you go into the master bedroom. It's a chaotic scene. Something happened here. This is probably where the murder occurred. The bed is missing. Obviously, the mattress and the box springs belong to that bed. It looks like a tornado has come through this room. There's all kinds of articles over the floor. There's blood staining. Blood spatter in various places on the walls. It was on uh, nightstands. When a stabbing occurs, the first stab, you don't pull blood out when you pull back. It's the second one that goes in. You're pulling blood out, and it'll throw some cast out. There were some pieces of carpet that uh, had been cut out and taken outside and thrown out there. There was a paint can and a paint roller off to the side on the floor. This appeared to us that uh, somebody was hastily trying to clean up this crime scene. There's signs of bleaching. People always want to use bleach when they're trying to clean up a crime scene to get rid of the blood. It looked like a cover-up gone wrong. When we pull him out of the ground, we think this is Jeffrey Wright. We didn't know where Susan Wright was. We didn't know where Jeffrey's children were. Did somebody abduct them and kill Jeffrey? There were a lot of unanswered questions. The media first hears about this murder the next day. Things like this did not happen in this part of Houston, and they did not happen with families like the Wrights. So this instantly had the focus of media from not only Houston and Texas, but around the nation. I was at work sitting at my desk and the phone rang, and it was our sales rep and he told me what happened to Jeff. I was just in shock. I just couldn't believe it. He was my friend. Jeff and Susan Wright, by all accounts, were a happy couple. They were young, beautiful. They had two little kids. I mean, they seemed to be living the American dream. Oh, good man. He was a good father, a good family man was just a good person. Jeff didn't deserve being stabbed. 
I start searching out Susan Wright and her family members. And we don't know what role any of them have or what information any of them may have. So several of my partners are out looking for them. They find the home of Susan's parents. They find the home of her sister, but nobody responds to the investigators. What's going on here? Why won't you let us talk to her? Later, we found out she checked herself into a psychiatric facility. 193 stab wounds. I've seen all kinds of trials in this town, and this was going to be the trial of the century. Like you're mad, like you're afraid, like you can't, can't stop. Objection, Your Honor. I'm going to ask the prosecutor to get back down in your seat. Jeffrey Wright is brutally, brutally, horribly murdered. Where is his wife? Why is she hiding? We didn't know what was going on in the beginning. Defense attorney Neil Davis informed the Harris County Sheriff's Office that Susan Wright was receiving psychiatric care in a hospital. I believe the children were with Susan's parents at that time. Why is she in a psych ward? Who put her there? How'd they get her in there? All those questions I didn't have the answers to, and it didn't make any sense. Susan has not given a statement to the police. And once Neil Davis identified himself as her lawyer, all communications that law enforcement would attempt with her have to go through him by law. According to the fingerprints taken by the medical examiner's office, the deceased was in fact identified as Jeff Wright. When he's laying on a table, you can see him and you got this massive amount of stab wounds on his chest, on his abdomen, legs and groin. 193 stab wounds. The medical examiner was able to locate a piece of metal in the top of his head, which uh, was consistent to the tip of a knife found in a flower pot. They also found some red wax on his legs and on his buttocks. Whoever committed this murder didn't just kill Jeffrey. There was this nick, not a stab, to his penis and to his eyeball. And those, to me, were the signs of torture. We got into the investigation, and it turns out that three days before Jeff's body is discovered, Susan reports Jeff to the police for abusing her and Bradley. Susan claimed that her and Jeff had had a fight. He had struck their son. She claimed that he had assaulted her and then threw a MasterCard at her for $100 and then walked away from his truck and wasn't coming back, which would explain why his truck was still there. The Jeff that I knew, he would never abuse his children. He loved them so much. <laughs> Finally, we were able to talk to Susan Wright's sister and to Susan Wright's parents and to get confirmation that their children were okay. But we were never able to speak to Susan. The only person doing all the talking on behalf of Susan Wright was Neil Davis, her lawyer. She uh, has been uh, in psychiatric care. She has been beaten for four years, uh, verbally abused. Her son was struck at least twice uh, by the deceased. Neil Davis's argument to the media is that she's a battered wife, she's abused, and that she had to resort to this level to defend herself and her children from the imminent threat that Jeffrey Wright was. Got nothing to hide. Uh, we're just interested in fairness and justice. I wasn't terribly surprised that they had to admit she killed Jeffrey because who in the heck else would have done it? I was more surprised with the way they presented the abuse and why she felt the need to kill Jeffrey. If you're a battered spouse, your state of mind based upon continuing chronic systemic abuse is not going to be the same as any one of us in this room when we're confronted with imminent danger. You may have a different picture of what type of danger is imminent and whether or not your response to use force or deadly force is reasonable.
Well, you have to remember that I grew up in an abusive house. And I lived with the mom that let a man abuse her for way too long. So I was never going to just discount a woman saying she was abused and blow it off. That was not going to happen. But I also wanted the proof. I took statements from friends and family, and we learned that Susan's family did not like Jeff. They didn't want her marrying him to begin with because he had a possession of marijuana. He had been arrested for theft and a bad check. Her parents had begged her to leave him and take the kids, but no one saw any injuries. There were no written reports or documented incidents for domestic violence. She also threw in the allegation that Jeffrey used cocaine, and when he did, that would make him more prone to lose his temper and become abusive to her and the kids. Jeff had cocaine in his system at the time he died. But on all of the interviews that were done with people that knew Jeff was that he was a hard worker, a personable guy, a good provider. He placed his family as a, as a high priority in his life. In Texas, if you intentionally take somebody's life, that's a murder case. If she was abused, in this situation, this night, when the stabbing happened, maybe she could claim self-defense at trial, which would make her not guilty, but she's still going to be looking at murder charges being filed against her. In this case, the evidence available was a very bloody, brutal crime scene. You were looking at a body that had been stabbed 193 times and buried, disposed of, and hidden. If you're a prosecutor who's been around for longer than five minutes, these things are not going to scream out self-defense to you. You're probably wondering, well, then how did she get those bruises on her hands and fingers when she made her domestic violence report a few days before Jeffrey's body was even found? I think that Susan might have gotten a couple of the bruises from murdering Jeffrey. She might have gotten some of the scratches from the knife she was holding, but I bet she got most of those bruises from taking apart a four-poster bed and dragging a 220-pound body across her bedroom, across her patio, and putting him in that hole. She probably got pretty dinged up doing all that. We know from the medical examiner, Jeffrey was killed on the 13th. I think that after she committed her murder, Susan somehow thought she could make it all go away tell people that Jeffrey ran off. It looked like a cover-up gone wrong or a big old change in plans because it just got overwhelming. And so the police report that Susan made at the constable's office was on the 15th. Then she hired a lawyer, and then she checked herself into a psychiatric facility to hide out from the police. Susan Wright had supportive parents. Susan Wright had a wonderful sister. Susan Wright is a beautiful, healthy American woman. She could have gotten out. It might have been rough. Jeffrey didn't want a divorce, but that's not an excuse to commit murder. When charges are finally filed against Susan, Neil Davis does what any good defense attorney would do at that time, which is orchestrate her surrender As we are getting ready to go to trial, Susan Wright is out on bond, which is not unexpected. She's just living her life, waiting until time to go to trial. To me, the evidence in this case was pretty clear. Susan Wright murdered Jeffrey. And I need to show a jury how cold-bloodedly and diabolically she tied him up and got on top of him before she started stabbing him. It feels so funny to look at all this stuff because it was such a part of my life 20 years ago. And all of these things are such an important part of the story. In preparing to go to trial, I would have been pretty stupid to not appreciate all of the things that Susan had going for her as a sympathetic defendant. How could a woman who looks like she could be the prototypical West Houston soccer mom find herself charged with murder, a crime that carries a possible punishment of 99 years or a life in a penitentiary? 
She's beautiful. She's young. She has a wonderfully supportive family. Most of our murder defendants don't have any of those things going for them, much less all of those things. So what punishment do you give a defendant who looks like her, who claims she was abused? That was always going to be the obstacle and the issue in this case. The only way to counteract that is to make a jury understand, no matter how she looks, what happened in that bedroom that night was the opposite of anything you might ever think this beautiful woman could have done. Kelly is already very well known within the district attorney's office. She definitely had a reputation with her, with her country accent and her ability to relate to a jury and try tough cases. Kelly Siegler versus Todd Ward and Neil Davis. The state versus Susan Wright was going to be the Harris County trial of the century. Hopefully we'll have a jury who will be fair and impartial and will set their emotions aside. Susan Lucille Wright stabbed and mutilated her husband, Jeffrey Wright, on January 13, 2003. Theirs was not a perfect marriage. The evidence will show you that, but whose is? Susan decided that she didn't want to get a divorce and that her better answer was to just eliminate Jeffrey. She also knew she was going to get a life insurance policy, $200,000. This case is not about self-defense. This case is about selfishness. She put all those wills in motion way before that horrible night in January. Die, bitch. Those were the words that Jeffrey Wright told Susan Wright the evening of January 13th, 2003, when he hovered over her in the bed with a knife. Nobody deserved to suffer the fate that Jeff Wright did. But make no mistake, I think there was a side of Jeff Wright that he did not want others to see. That side existed. For years before this incident, Jeffrey Wright kicked, pushed, and punched Susan Wright. I think that marriages where abuse is systemic, women can't leave. Women don't leave. Susan Wright had two kids. She had nowhere to go. They struggle, and she gets the knife, and she stabs Jeff. And she stabs him several times, but she's in such a panic, she thought her husband was still alive. She goes and she gets a necktie and ties his hand to the bed, and she continues stabbing him. She believed that she had to use not just force, but deadly force to repel an attack from her husband that she believed meant the difference between life and death. How do you claim self-defense when the person you're defending yourself against can't use his hands and he's laying on a bed tied up and he can't move? What are you defending yourself against exactly? I always believed that I had to drive home to a jury and not just tell them about what Susan did in that bedroom that night, but show them. We had left the bed downstairs in the special crimes division. We had the bed brought up and me, the, the sheriff's investigators, put it back together. You got to make it come alive. You can't just sit in your chair and talk to the witness in the stand and just discuss it theoretically. You got to make it hit home to a jury. Hit them upside the head with it. That's what you have to do. And any prosecutor that doesn't do that is not doing their job. I wanted the jury to go, God, OK, she did that? And you want me to say Jeffrey was a jerk of a husband, therefore excuse her conduct? Uh-uh. You have Neil and you have Todd who are just looking at it like a freight train that they can't get off the tracks for. They had objected in advance, but that freight train was coming. We want the bed of Susan and Jeffrey Wright admitted into evidence because we want to take that bed and show the jury exactly what that bed was that night in their house. It was a murder weapon, just like the knife. 
The bed was assembled and it was showtime. All rise for jury, please. Kelly absolutely is known for the great level of empathy that she has for the victims of any violent crime. She had many meetings with Jeff Wright's family. She wasn't going to let them be surprised by, by how upsetting the evidence was about to become for them. When you're a prosecutor, your job is to seek justice. Jeffrey Wright's family was a typical good family. What happened to them was horrible. Detective Reynolds, are these the pieces recovered from the scene on Barry Street Road? Yes, ma'am, they are. If I stand next to the defendant and we're both barefooted, do we appear to be the same height? Very close. Okay, thank you. Is Paul Doyle the same size and approximate height as Jeffrey Wright, 6'2", 220? Yes, ma'am. Paul Doyle is another prosecutor that I had luckily convinced Kelly had a much more similar stature and build to Jeff Wright than I did. I was definitely not going to be the guy that demonstrated in the bed. Think I could take a knife away from him? Objection, speculation, Your Honor. The district attorney's office at that time is it was still fairly old fashioned and there was a rule in the employee handbook that any female prosecutor in trial had to wear a skirt or a dress. So on that day, I had to get permission to wear a pantsuit, not a skirt. And I don't think I even told them because I need to straddle somebody. How about if you stand at that corner right there, right by Mr. Davis? The risk I was taking with the jury, trying to show them exactly how this went down, they could have thought I was being too theatrical. I didn't want to even have one juror kind of do this. Because mm -mm. it only takes one juror that you upset and you're toast. But I also hope that by the time I argued to them, they would understand why I did it. And they would deliver the verdict that I thought was justice. Show the jury the way the left wrist was tied. Kelly made sure that Mark Reynolds did a really good job of, of duplicating and setting up the scene to make it as close to the night of the murder. I had examined the ligatures at the autopsy when they were cleaned up. And then later, after they were removed. What Susan did that night, she started out flirting. She stripped down. He stripped down, or she helped him. She talked him and teased him into letting her tie up probably his feet first and then his hands. This wasn't the first time they did this. They'd done it before. And what tells me that is the candle wax. It was spilt by his groin, by his penis, because she was teasing him with that, too, to set the scene. So if, if the defendant were to get up on top of Jeffrey Wright, something like this, and straddle him, and she's right-handed, and I attack at the head area first, which side of his face or most of the injury is going to be on? On this side. During the bed demonstration, Susan is cognizant of the fact that people are watching her. So she is trying to act like this bed horrifies her. It felt like she was making some mistakes with when she would cry and how she would cry. She wasn't coached very well, in my opinion. Where were most of the wounds concentrated on the body of Jeffrey Wright? In the chest, the, the neck and the chest. Did you see anything consistent with a stab to the penis? Not to the penis itself, no. Because you saw what? It was nicked. It was a superficial cut. Super of a slicing. Superficial slicings like this. Right. It was all Kelly. She became Susan Wright, and she got her message across very loud and very clear on how horrible the final moments of Jeff Wright actually were. We're never going to have the time to go through 193 stab wounds. To me, in addition to the number, was the fact that there was some overkill. Nicks and pricks. Susan stuck him in the eye and stuck him in the penis. How is that self-defense? If he's like this, tied up, and she's on top of him, somehow she can stab him towards the center of his back or below that blade. I think you'll be surprised at his mobility once you put that knife in his chest. Neil Davis wanted to make a big deal out of the very few stab wounds that were toward the back of Jeffrey's body. And Mark Reynolds answered him and said, if you're twisting and turning and trying with all your might to get away from being tied up, she's going to slip a little. The knife is going to get bloody a little. It's not going to be a perfectly, completely all on the front bite. 
what Kelly did, recreating her take on what happened, was genius. It was courtroom theater. Everyone was riveted. We had not seen that level of drama and demonstration in a courtroom ever. There are people out there to this day that think it was too much, it was too dramatic. I've heard the criticism, but I'll stick with what I believe. After putting on all those witnesses and doing the demonstration and it turning out as well as I hoped it would, we rested our case. And then it was time for us to hear once and for all what the defense was really going to say happened. Your other defense would call Susan Ray. If there was any moment that was going to outshine the bed demonstration, it was going to be Susan Wright's testimony. When they called Susan Wright to the stand, my first thought was, great, because we have no idea what they're going to say. She's never been interviewed. What type of things would set Jeff off? If the light bills were more than what he thought they should be, um, if the house wasn't perfect, if dinner was bad, Susan spends the entire first part of her testimony describing her relationship with, with Jeff. He continually punched me in the chest and in the stomach until he wasn't angry anymore. He told me that he had a past um, problem with drugs, but that he had been in recovery for quite a while. The defense spent a good amount of time building up how bad Jeffrey was, that he was a jerk, that he was mean, that he was insulting, and they should have. That was a smart strategy to try to use. Jeff came home the 13th, Monday evening, and what did he want to do? He had just gotten done with a boxing lesson, and he wanted to box with Bradley. Jeff got his hands up and started making jabs at Bradley's head. What did Jeff's eyes look like? Red and glassy. He was very agitated, very excitable. The fact that the autopsy showed that Jeff had cocaine in his system adds at least incrementally credence to Susan's story because people who are high on cocaine sometimes not only act out, but appear to have strength beyond their normal parameters. I walked up to him and I told him that I thought that he needed help with his anger and with drugs. He threw me to the ground, my head hit the ottoman and he was kicking me. And he said, die, bitch, and I opened up my eyes. Did you see the same butcher knife you'd seen? I saw it in his hand, and it was by his head, and it was shining off the light. And I got it from him. I got it, and it was in my right hand. And I pushed him as hard as I could. I pushed him off of me. To say that Jeffrey and Susan struggled over a knife makes no sense. Jeffrey outweighed Susan by exactly 100 pounds, and he was almost a foot taller than her. I was afraid that if I left the room, then Jeff was going to get up, and he was going to come after me. And then I tied up his right arm to the bed so that he couldn't get up. She's trying to make the jury believe that she somehow is able to overpower him and get the knife, and she ties up his hands. I started stabbing him again, and I couldn't stop because I was so scared. And the reason she is stabbing him because she is broken with reality. You dragged him off the bed? <laughs> yes, I did. Did he hit it then? He hit the nightstand, and the candle went flying, and it fell on Jeff. So she said that the candle wax got knocked over when she went to put him on the dolly to take him outside to the hole. But come on. Think about where the end table is. How in the hell is it going to get on his groin? Because she was teasing him with that to set the mood, to set the scene. Now, at one point in the middle of him being tightly tied up, it turned into rage and violence and murder. I don't know. Pass the witness, Your Honor. Thank you. The secret, please. When that gate opens and Kelly has to make a decision, should I act like I'm sympathetic to what she has gone through, or should I be dismissive of it and blow it out of the water? I started that cross-examination with the plan to be very calm and even killed and not get bitchy. But it was easy to get annoyed with her because she was lying. 
by Saturday you had gone to the doctor, gone to the cops, tried bleach, tried paint, tried to get rid of the carpet. That was cleaning. I thought it was dirt and I had to make the house clean because Jeff was going to be mad. That's right. And all the years of your marriage to Jeff, you always cleaned up the dirt with paint, didn't you? No, but the house was dirty and I had to make the house perfect. She decided to go hard at Susan and there was certainly a, a risk in that. When you stabbed him the 89th time or the 158th time, was your arm getting tired? I was in such a, a state of shock and panic and sure terror and fear that none of that ever occurred to me. I remember when I was handling this case, my husband and I would talk about certain things, and in this case, the brutalness of 193 stab wounds. My daughter, who was about 10, she's the one who told me, Mommy, didn't she get tired? I thought, of course she had to have gotten tired. That's a picture of his penis. Unlike what you see on TV, in Texas, you're required to sit at counsel table as you question a witness. The only reason you get to let you approach a defendant or a witness is to point out something with evidence. And I approached Susan Wright because I had a picture. It was the one of the stab wounds close to Jeffrey's groin area. And I wanted to show her that. But she did that extra little, like, she was so, oh my God, overwhelmed with that picture. And that just pissed me off. Don't be acting so offended about what you did. You didn't stab his penis. That's not a stab like this. Like you're mad, like you're afraid, like you can't, can't stop. Objection, Your Honor. I'm going to ask the prosecutor to get back down in the seat, please, and refrain from doing this two feet from the witness. I did not sit there and slice at him. I did not do that. Yes, you did. I didn't. No, I did not. No. I'm done judging. Immediately after the cross-examination, we took a break, and a couple of people said, damn, girl, you went kind of hard at her, and I thought, ooh, I don't know if I want to hear that. So I wasn't 100% sure what the jury thought. You have to determine if Susan Wright was in imminent fear and whether she acted in self-defense. Because she looks like that, she thinks she can get away with fooling all 12 of you. She turned that bedroom into a torture chamber. She turned that bed into a butcher block. She is guilty of murder. After a week and a half of testimony, the jury took five hours to come up with a verdict. Stand. We, the jury, find the defendant, Susan Lucille Wright, guilty of murder as charged in the indictment. Obviously, I was happy with the answer. But once the jury found Susan Wright guilty of murder, the biggest, most important, most difficult part of the trial was still to come, her punishment. In Texas, we have a very unique system. Texas lets juries and not judges assess punishment in non-death penalty cases. The worries that I had going into the punishment phase were that they were going to buy into the marriage being a bad one and they were gonna cut her slack. There is a real world where Susan Wright can get as little as five years probation for murder. The whole game in this trial was making the jury understand she does not deserve probation or the minimum range of punishment or anywhere close to that for what she did to Jeffrey Wright. We certainly had the, the very sympathetic testimony of, of Jeff's family. Stab him in the eyeballs, but he's so quick. You can't believe she did. She's evil. <laughs> Those were certainly emotional pulls for the jury to consider. Ultimately, the jury comes back pretty quickly. Jeffrey's family asked why it wasn't a life without parole, but they're never going to be happy with the answer. How could they be? Their family had been broken forever. And the kids, they went to live with Jeffrey's brother and his wife to let them grow up without her being anywhere around them to further ruin their lives.
The judge found that her trial lawyers in our trial didn't put on enough of a defense about battered wife. I remember thinking they didn't do it the way I thought they would do it. I can't argue with that. Does she deserve a whole new punishment hearing because of that strategic choice that they all made? I didn't think she did. I was able to get Susan a new punishment hearing and shave ultimately five years off of her original 25 year sentence. So what? The second jury pretty much saw it the exact same way. They all had to go through all that misery and pain all over again. So in the end, what was the point? Susan Wright, the woman dubbed the blue-eyed butcher. Guess what, folks? She's out of prison. Released this morning at 930 from this facility, this women's facility right behind me. In December of 2020, when Susan Wright was released from prison, the media went crazy. They were blowing up my phone. It was all over the news. They were hounding her. It was a really big story. Please don't do this to my family. Please stop. Have sure. a heart, please. If the courtroom is a theater of law, then this trial had its share of theater. Some would say more than its share. I say just enough. People don't want me to talk about what she was doing on top of that bed, on top of his body, because that's inflammatory and that's over the top and that's grandstanding. Give me a break. It was the right thing to do, because I guarantee you there is not one single person that was in that courtroom that walked away not knowing exactly what Susan Wright did. That night, she decided to murder Jeffrey. Susan Wright served her sentence. Her children and Jeffrey's family are still paying their sentence. They're still suffering because Jeffrey's gone forever. That's never going to change. We don't use the word closure. What the hell is closure? Closure means gaining peace. That's a bunch of bullshit. All we can try to get in the real world is justice. <laughs>